they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Sometimes in emphasizing that Jesus was truly God, it's easy to forget that he was also human. Suffering was not foreign to Jesus. He knew and felt pain. Being God, he knew the future agony he was about to face. He felt overwhelmed with the prospect that faced him. In the intimate language that only a son could have for his dear father, Jesus cried out, Abba, Daddy, please find another way. But then he submitted his human will to his heavenly father and prayed, Your will be done. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. Now the word he does not appear in the original Greek text. It was supplied to help the English rendering flow better, but in this case it distracts from the power of what Jesus said. Jesus answered the question with an emphatic, I am. It could be translated literally, I am right now God. I am is God's name, and it wasn't just anyone using it. God himself was using his own name. The effect is worth noting. When Jesus said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. They not only fell down, they drew back and fell down. Jesus blew them off their feet with a mini burst of his majesty. After the stunned group had gotten up and dusted themselves off, again he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. You could almost sense the crowd's respect and fear, for Jesus had unsettled the mob. This was not shaping up to be a typical arrest. Their wall of confidence cracked even more when Jesus revealed that he knew the agreed upon sign of betrayal. Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The other eleven disciples were galvanized into action. Simon Peter had a weapon. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. What can you say? Even in the midst of all attention, Jesus was thinking of others. He healed the high priest's servant. It was a short-sighted effort on Peter's part anyway, zeal without knowledge. On a human level, the disciples were greatly outnumbered. But you can't help admiring Peter's efforts. At least he tried to do something. But obviously, Peter was better with nets than swords. When you aim at the head and get an ear, it tells you something. <laughs> then Jesus asked a question, an uncomfortable question. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me? but the scriptures must be fulfilled. God's questions always expose a person's true thoughts. And if the rabble had taken a moment to think, they would have realized the inconsistency of their actions. But they were so fixated in their determination to do away with Christ, 
Even another encounter with the miraculous power of this man didn't deter them the least bit. Fearing for their lives, the disciples fled into the night. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him. One can hardly read this without feeling some sense of incongruity. Jesus was only one individual. The detachment sent to arrest him would have numbered between 300 and 600 soldiers. In addition, there were Jewish officials, priests, and servants. It was an overkill for sure. But you can't help wondering if deep down inside they felt a poverty of power. They rushed Jesus and bound him. Satan must have chortled with delight. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Temple courts were not held at night. The fact that the Sanhedrin, consisting of 71 men, could be assembled so quickly tells you something about the plot. Keep in mind that there were no phones back then, and to get the Sanhedrin together in the middle of the night would have been quite a feat. Their willingness to convene at that hour reveals even more. What they were doing was strictly illegal according to their own law. Even for those not familiar with the judicial system of that day, the irregularities of the trial are painfully obvious. No matter, forget the rules. They wanted Jesus dead. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? The question was black and white. Are you God or not? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. The high priest Caiaphas knew exactly what Jesus had said. Jesus was claiming to be God himself. Blasphemy was anything that was considered injurious to God's character, and for a mere man to call himself God was sacrilege. But Jesus wasn't a mere man. He was God. However, neither Caiaphas nor the other Jewish leaders believed him, so they condemned him to die. But there was a problem. The Sanhedrin did not have the authority to pass the death sentence. Only the Romans could do that. 